Is that correct? Yes. And uh, she's the executive director of UPROSE, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. And she is the chair of a US EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And I think you told me on the phone you were involved with a White House function? I will be speaking in the White House in two weeks on the You EJ can tell us. Yeah. yeah. So, buenas tardes, compañeros y compañero. I greet you all in Spanish just to remind you you're in New York City. Um, and to remind you that by 2042, we will be the majority. Um, and it's true. And it's important that you realize that because here on this panel, uh, a lot of the right questions have been raised, like what are the appropriate relationships? What is meaningful community engagement? And if you look at the panel, and if you take a minute and look around and look at each other, you will see what the nature of the challenge is. You should experience that. You should feel uncomfortable. You should think, how do we get out of this comfort zone and build non-traditional relationships that are going to resonate on the ground? I am the authentic grassroots community voice on this panel. I represent a grassroots organization that has been around since the civil rights movement. We do environmental justice, and environmental justice means that we speak for ourselves. And so regardless of people's good intentions, unless the people who are speaking for the communities are of the community, it is going to be a substantial challenge developing community resilience that makes sense for our communities. Um, it was mentioned that I was going to be at the White House in two weeks, and I just want to talk about that briefly, because at the White House, there is going to be a forum on environmental justice where EPA is looking at integrating environmental justice into rulemaking, into permitting, into every single agency that serves uh, this country. Environmental justice has become a priority because thinking about how the most vulnerable communities in our country are addressed when it comes to their environmental challenges has to be a priority. Um, this is Sunset Park, and if you look at the map, this map was created for us by the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, which we're members of. You could see what a potential storm surge, how far it goes into the community. We've got about 1,200 manufacturers on the waterfront. We've got all of our infrastructure, power plants, sewage treatment, waste transfer stations, uh, all of that stuff on the waterfront, including people because it's a mixed-use zone. So. We have been working now for the past few years on developing a plan that engages people on a very grassroots level on prevention and proactiveness so that they understand that if government fails us, what do we do as a community? What is our responsibility? And there are several meetings taking place as we speak with a variety of stakeholders. When we talk about non-traditional partners, we're talking about manufacturers sitting with bodegueros. Uh, we're talking about people who typically don't have a conversation with each other, building consensus and developing the language, but the language needs to be accessible on a grassroots level. A lot of uh, science is, is, we have a lot of science, but scientists really have to get out of the ivory towers and into the streets. Uh, the science has to be accessible also at a grassroots level. Because many times people have deficit-based expectations of our institutions, they don't realize that we're doing mapping, that we're doing planning, that we're actually moving uh, infrastructure into a green economy and that we're working out of the box and that what used to be the traditional issues of employment, social services, uh, education are now issues that are dealing with our right to breathe. So it's important that when you think about how you develop those relationships with institutions that you don't determine success by the size of the budget or the size of the institution in developing those partnerships, that the answers really lie in the small churches, in the bodegas, as I mentioned, and grassroots organizations that actually have street cred, because those are the people that people in the community are going to listen to. When we started putting together the Community Resilience Plan, we listened. We put together, we brought all these people together and we listened to what their concerns and priorities are. And they talked about what will happen to our children if someone's physically disabled, if someone has a mental health issue, if it's an LGBTQ couple, what happens? Do they have a right to have access to their families? Uh, if the people are undocumented, what happens? All the kinds of questions that surfaced in New Orleans are also surfacing in our community. And these Community Resilience Plans are happening all over the country. The thing we do know is that community resilience is going to look different in every single community. Every single community is going to have a different response, is going to determine what priorities are important to them, and that it can be a top-down and it can be something that is 
dressed up as something that's inclusive when it really isn't. Uh, so when people talk about buy-in or coming to the community with an agenda, if the agenda has already been set, you have a community responding to someone else's agenda. So it really has to be created with community at the table. How do you engage communities that are not civic happy? If you're in Sunset Park and you go to Park Slope and Park Slope has a meeting, you will see tons of people show up. They will show up because the nannies that take care of their children live in Sunset Park. So in Sunset Park, in order to engage people, you need to provide child care, you need to provide translation, you need to provide food, because when people work two or three jobs, it's really difficult for them at the end of the day to go want to go to a community meeting. So they, want to, they need to know what's in their interest, what's in it for them. And so we connect community resilience to public health, and we connect it through an environmental justice analysis where people actually know that it's not just about reducing carbons, it's also about reducing co-pollutants, the things that get entrapped in the narrow air passages of our children. Making those connections is extremely important. Being able to speak the multiplicity of languages and being intergenerational is also important. You often hear youth-led and adult-led. It has to be we-led. At our organization, there are young people on our staff, on our board of directors. We have a group, uh, our age ranges from 10 on in terms of including people at different levels between the wisdom and keeping it fresh and keeping it real. You have real community solutions. With gentrification taking place in our communities, we find that the power paradigm changes, and that presents a challenge in our communities. When you basically have communities that are more privileged, really marginalizing and silencing people that have less privilege, maybe don't speak the language, or maybe don't feel the power in the same way, but come in really heavy, we need to do this climate change thing, there is a necessity to really check the privilege at the door and figure out how you facilitate community leadership instead of supplanting it. So it's important for people to do a self-assessment in figuring out how they're going to work with communities in a way that's respectful and uplifting. Another thing that's extremely important is that you do an assets mapping of the community. There are assets that don't always make it on the map. Where are the strengths of the community? How do you keep it culturally grounded so that you are not imposing a culture and a worldview that comes from some small town that just moved into Red Hook? Um, you need to be able to do it in a way that is culturally respectful and really looks at the value of all of those assets. And sometimes it could be on this neighbor who actually knows the history of the community and has the ability to persuade and bring people out. We have in our community, different coalitions. There's one person who can bring in 30 elders, or one person who can bring in 15 young people. Who are those people, and how do we get them to be engaged, and do it in a way that's meaningful and supports them, and supports the challenges that they're already faced with academically? So a lot of times, when our communities don't participate at the level that others expect them to, they say, well, we have to do this because people just don't want to participate. They don't want to, they don't want to do this. Without asking themselves how their own behavior is preventing people from participating in a meaningful way. Meaningful participation is a challenge. It takes time. It also takes doing all the legwork, making sure that people have the information so that you level the playing field, so that people who typically have not been involved in talking about infrastructure, climate adaptation, or community resilience actually have the same language, have the same resources available that people who come in prepared for that. Also, taking advantage of the kinds of institutions that exist in our community so that they can provide us with resources. Uprose is working with about 16 graduate students from Pratt, 11 law students from Brooklyn College who are working with the community to try to look at a variety of climate adaptation models and community resilience responses. They're looking at short-term, medium-term, and long-term plan, everything from cool roofs to blue roofs to water roofs, and any, anything that you can think of that's out there that's available available to designers, architects, engineers, is all becoming part of what the community is looking at. 
the issue is huge and it could be overwhelming and people can become really apocalyptic and think, you know, there's nothing we can do about this. Or they can think about what they can do on a very individual basis on their home and they could think about what they could do collectively as a community. And I can tell you right now that last night we had a meeting where we had doctors, we had church people, and we had people from the community all talking to each other and we'll have another meeting again tonight. That it's something that has taken us two years and we're not there yet, but something that really has to happen in every every single community. Um, and if you do it in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's respectful, in a way that really honors the culture and traditions of every community, I can assure you that people will get it. They will understand that climate is about them. Gracias. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, left. Thank you, panelists, for all being on time. Um, I have just a couple of uh, comments which might be in the form of questions to start things off. Um, this morning, David Bragdon uh, cited a, a range of sea level rise uh, between 12 inches and 55 inches uh, by 2080. That's uh, amongst many other estimates, of course, for different time periods. But I, one of the most perplexing uh, questions really is how do we communicate and inform uh, the public, however you divide up the public, uh, when the range of risk is so uh, hard to pin down? What do you plan for? This is nothing new in flood hazard mapping and flood insurance program and so on. They've been grappling with uncertainty for uh, the last 40 years and a lot longer than that with the Corps of Engineers and structural flood control. But that's, that's one question, that there isn't any certainty about the level of sea level rise change. It certainly is changing and rising. Secondly, how do you generate political will, to use Tony's phrase? Uh, government at all levels is increasingly wary of any kind of coercion, regulatory power. You must do such and such. And we've learned lessons in the past through terrible experience, like the Triangle Fire of 1911 uh, that uh, killed sweatshop workers by over 150 of young women and it led to some mandatory fire safety improvements in New York City and elsewhere. That's, those are two uh, questions of a general nature. Would any of you like to respond on either of those? Uh, I realize it's tricky to pose two questions at once, but political will and uncertainty of level of risk. Tony? some of the sea level rise scenarios um, to really uh, planning at the local level and then integrating it within some storm surge and other models is work that still needs to be done. So A, I'd say create that certainty um, within a, a range that I think is acceptable. I think that's there. Secondly, I think you really need to make it uh, expressed in, 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 in local, locally relevant terms and whether you're going to do that through hazards or do whatever your, your example around what you're going to talk about it. Again, I do think you need to be a little more disciplined about what you're going to talk about because sea level rise, climate change, and resilience aren't all the same things. We're all fat factors of each other. So if you're doing it uh, to create the political will, make sure you, you, you try to figure out, I'm an old lobbyist, I sort of did that for a while there. So, so you need to figure out what your objective is um, and then create uh, 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 that political will around some action uh, that you're looking at. I think it's, it's doable. I, I think um, in New, I'm sorry. I think Elizabeth in New York City there Bill. is political will. I mean, I, I think that um, to say there's not political will in New York City when we have Plan YC 2030 is to prevent that we didn't pass the green buildings legislation, the solid waste management plan, or any of the things that we have been able to do. It's really the first time that an administration works closely with advocates and advocates and, and activists and tries to develop a community outreach plan to get communities at the table. That's never never happened before. And people can be critical and say, well, we 
we can go further when you know we definitely could go further and and we are saying that as as activists we want to work with the administration to make them more effective but i think the challenge is creating the groundswell of support that will survive this administration i think that that's our challenge uh, on the ground on the state level i would say that um i was a little disappointed with the climate adaptation plan even though um even though there were people there who worked really hard to make it happen and were really looking out because I felt that a regional approach was more important than a statewide approach because each region's needs are so different. And then nationally, that, that's, a big, that's a big question mark because we are, we're getting so much pushback from people who think that the, that the polar ice caps aren't melting. Uh, but talking to the people in Alaska, which I do, uh, they will tell you that they are the, at the first line of, of experience uh, uh, climate change, the people who are the native people, the indigenous people from those, those territories. So um, the political will varies depending on who we're talking about. But in New York City, um, I think that um, David Brangden and, and uh, the, the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability, that is a serious priority. Thank you. And Bill? Uh, just a, a, sh a short comment uh, to add on to that. The idea of how to respond to the uncertainty, I think one of the things that people are thinking about is the flexibility to be, uh, have, uh, um, to be, have adaptation strategies that are flexible to sort of emerging understanding. Um, and that with that, to also identify those opportunities that um, will help us make the city more resilient in the face of our current understanding of, of the risk levels associated with extreme events, as well as sort of future um, uh, sea level rise um, aided um, uh, disasters and so forth. So to, so to think of it in terms of flexibility and also um, you know, the, the various sort of options to sort of um, provide benefits for now and the future. And just a, a, another part of that is that that's, yes, that seems like a big gap of uncertainty, but everybody in this room and everyone I know can, can kind of grasp that there's, some, there's a range of reaction that's going to be needed and we need to start at one place, and, and, but consider all the different storylines that might come and that kind of emerging conversation about how, to, how do we move from, play, to, from point to point is not something that would block effective action or organizing just because there's too much uncertainty there. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll open this up to questions from the floor. At, do, do you have a mic? Um, we have the mic here. Please, um, go ahead. I, I have the mic first. Uh, my name is Alice Labrie, and I live on the Harlem River. And I would like to address this question to OEM. Um, we all saw what happened during 9-11 when you couldn't, there were areas of the island that you couldn't get off because it has solid you know, fences and so forth. So I'm still worried. And I went to a conference at NIMTEC where they talked about using uh, FedEx trucks, et cetera, you know, to evacuate us. So has that been given a lot of thought about the evacuation of us? Yes, um, very good question. So her question was how, how is OEM planning in terms of evacuations? So we have a couple plans in place. One is f specifically for coastal storm evacuations. We have uh, predetermined locations where we can uh, put resources and also make use of mass transit, make use of buses, get extra, uh, uh, excuse me, get extra resources available for people to get that information. But the main thing that we're talking about in terms of evacuation is getting people to understand the urgency of it when it does happen. Because what we don't want to happen is have people stuck in their homes. If people need additional help, this is a time for people to start thinking about it now. Yes, there are big picture things where you have evacuations, but just two days ago we had people evacuate their home in the Bronx because it was a three-story fire. So evacuations can happen in any specific, you know, it just depends on the type of uh, scale of the type of emergency. But um, just going back to your, your question about in terms of the planning and how do people get out of the places that they need to go to, a lot of our focus is... Yes, so that, and that, that's a good question. We get a lot of those questions. How do I know where to go if, if, I have, if I'm told to evacuate? It depends on the type of emergency. It could be an emergency where it happens in one location and that facility that you're used to seeing, like it may be a school or so forth, may not be the place that you would go to. So coastal storm evacuations are things that we can sort of plan for, like we know where to put people out of the flood zones. Evacuations that happen if there's a, you know, it could be a, a gas leak or something like that. Those things we don't expect to happen. So that's why we don't necessarily publish like locations of like disaster shelters, because that situation can change. Um, in the, was your hand up, sir? Yes, yeah. Oh, he is. 
I question uh, Alan Margolin at Friends of Hudson River Park. Question for anyone on the panel who who will uh, we'll take the question. Following up on comments from Elizabeth and uh, and Dr. Selecki, um, we New, New York is not an island, even though some of the boroughs are. We're we're swimming in an ocean of CO2, and while we're we're taking the city is taking lots of uh, good actions, unless there's a tie-in with the federal government on action to reduce the CO2, the kinds of sea level rise, the kinds of storm surges that we're concerned about that we saw in, in the Nor'easter in the late 90s that impacted on the subways that, that you spoke about, Dr. Selecki. Uh, when we look at uh, JFK and LaGuardia being only a foot or two above sea level and some of the, the subways and path lines being so far below sea level, as much as we can do as a city for ourselves, we continue to be overwhelmed by the CO2 that's put out by the country as a whole. And, and my question is, what is the city doing? What can the city be doing to try to encourage the feds to start to take more action while, while there is gridlock in, in Washington on this issue? Because we, we can do a great deal in the city, but still the impacts are gonna be felt here no matter what kind of adaptation we put in effect unless the emissions are brought down. So I think you raise a, a really great point that New York, uh, while we emit a lot of carbon ourselves, there's obviously emissions from all over the world. And so what we can do, so obviously this is a difficult time to be lobbying Congress to, to pass some sort of a bill, but we continue to take public stands on that there needs to be uh, federal action to put some sort of a system in place for uh, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, when the cap and trade bill was going through Congress last summer, the Waxman Mar Markey bill, we put out statement in support of that. The mayor has called in the past on a carbon tax. Uh, there are, certainly needs to be some sort of a federal uh, position taken by Congress, and we've, we've spoken out on that. Uh, however, uh, we are doing some other things working with the cities, uh, both uh, in the U.S. and internationally. The mayor was recently elected the president of the, of the C40 coalition, which was originally founded by the Clinton Climate Initiative. And what it is, it's a coalition of the 40 largest cities in the world. And then there's additional members as well uh, that are slightly smaller. And trying to work internationally with other cities so that we can learn from each other and also uh, form together to, to lobby for action, both in our, our, our governments, uh, wherever they may be, and also with the UN. So the mayor believes in this, certainly, and has taken stances uh, nationally and internationally to try to, 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 to both lead by example, but also to press for further action from others. Okay, uh, one more comment from Bill, and then we'll take one more question after that. Well, just a, a brief follow-up to, to, to Aaron's comment. I mean, the cities in generally, in general, sort of uh, globally, have been really at the lead in response to sort of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also adaptation. And um, uh, Aaron mentioned the one example is also the Mayor's Council on uh, on climate change and many others. Um, ICLE, uh, another organization involved in sort of getting municipalities to connect with this issue. Um, and so there are lots of reasons why this is the case. But I mean, and New York City is really the kind of a lead um, amongst amongst those groups of, of cities. So this is where the real action is happening. Relatively little, unfortunately, at the moment at, at the federal level is going on. It's your turn. Thank you. Emlyn Costa, Liberty Science Center and a geologist before I moved to the museum field. I'd like to make a, a comment, uh, which I think is factual, about both sea level rise and, and severe hurricanes and ask the panel uh, for any reaction. Uh, the, the highest figure we've seen today and in this session about sea level rise is something approaching six, seven, or eight feet by the end of this uh, uh, century. Uh, the tidal range in around New York of about six, seven feet at, at peak tide uh, ranges, spring and neap uh, tides, often laps up within two or three feet of the, of the edge of the, of the land. So nobody's talking about what uh, that degree of sea level rise would be in terms of causing the inundated marginal zones of the coastline to be like a Venice in which you have to have boardwalks to allow you to keep your feet dry because this session was about the water's edge. We're describing the hazard, but we're not responding, I don't think, to what actually is required in order to adjust to a, a higher sea level against current planned elevations of the shoreline. But much more severe than that, is a, the situation which I understand to be the worst case scenario, and I'd like to suggest that it could overwhelm the area 
like uh, New Orleans was overwhelmed by Katrina in terms of evacuation gridlock, a breakdown of law and order, a uh, catastrophic uh, lack of human services, and basically mayhem and a depopulation and the worst case scenario which none of, uh, of, of this has described. The worst case scenario of storm surge is, as I understand it, uh, when the wa coastal waters are at their warmest and a hurricane of, say, uh, magnitude three is tracking up the east coast with its uh, eye on the, just over the land, which would put the uh, peak winds and storm surge right in line for the Verrazano Narrows area. And because of the right angle coastline configuration of Long Island and the New Jersey shore, category three hurricanes create category five effects. So we're talking about maybe six feet of, of sea level rise gradually due to climate change over the next part of this century. Next summer, we could have a, within six hours, a sea level rise three times that, exacerbated by storm-driven waves for a total super elevation of sea level within a matter of half a day with little or no forecast that people want to believe in that could be in excess of 20, 25 feet. I believe that has a risk of creating an overwhelming situation. Uh, the Red Cross is woefully unprepared by its own admission in terms of volunteers. They have about a fifth of the volunteer force they need. Mm -hmm. And so what is the actual preparedness for what would be probably the world's costliest business interruption? Because I don't think, uh, respectfully, the plans are realistic against the worst case scenario, either in the long term or in terms of what could happen next summer. We are overdue, and as one of the panelists said, we're a particularly vulnerable part of the coastline. I can actually take a quick answer for that question. What you mentioned was probably the New York bite. What New York City specifically for OEM, what we do, we actually do plan for the worst case scenario. What you, reckon, what you had uh, recalled was in terms of the eye of the storm. If the eye of the storm is over Atlantic City, that causes all this water to push, push, push. We have now potentially a 30 foot storm surge in our current figures in terms of our sea level rise. That would dramatically affect areas in terms of the Rockaways. Uh, those areas definitely would need to be evacuated. Specifically for New York City, what a lot of our planning has to do around is continuity of services, and that's a big part of our administration is to focus on the, our coop plans, or continuity of operations, to be able to make sure that we have essential services such as sanitation and moving people out and quick, as quickly as they need to. A lot of that comes down to just getting people to know where, they, where it is that they need to go. And a lot of what we spent specifically uh, after Hurricane Katrina was a big investment on doing direct outreach to neighborhoods. It was probably about, about a million plus people that we did specific mailings to, did a vast outreach campaign going community board to community board and talking to residents about what it is that they could do to prepare themselves. And yes, it will be scary. Yes, it will be chaotic. But what we're doing is training New York City staff to be able to respond to those things. You mentioned the fact that the Red Cross may be understaffed, and we realized that. What we did was that we created a program called Storm Staff in which we trained um, I don't exactly know the number of city employees, but the goal is was to train about, f I think, 40,000 or so city employees to be able to help with shelter management and operations. So we've done that training about two years ago, and what they're trained in is how to be able to respond and help people should they need assistance um, if they actually go to a specific shelter. So there is planning involved. Yes, it would be chaotic. Yes, it's something that New York City has never experienced. It, you know, it, it's something that we, we develop plans for, but will we know if they actually work? We test them. We, we try our best to make sure that we can engage communities, engage our, our first response community in training and, and those types of things to be able to address how we can better respond to something. But you're absolutely right, the fact that things would be chaotic for people. And it's about maintaining that sense of preparedness now. So if we do get a storm next summer, people know what it is and where they need to go uh, for additional help. Hope that answers your question. Elizabeth. Let, let me respond to this by saying that in disasters, New Yorkers are very kind to each other. That's my preface to what I'm about to say. So as we develop these community resilience models, we do it with the idea that government will fail. That in if the Office of Environmental um, Management uh, can evacuate two million people, and they're evacuating people uh, in the Bronx, that Brooklyn is in a lot of trouble. Um, just because we know what happened in New Orleans and we know uh, w that we've just had two tornadoes in Brooklyn, um, so we have been having conversations about what is attenuation of sea level rise? How do you create 
real barriers and natural or unnatural barriers to slow down the water. What happens when the water comes in? All of those chemicals are going to be washed. We don't even know what those chemicals are in the waterfront. They're going to be washed into our community and they're going to remain there after the water comes back out again and create a huge brown field. What does the community do under these circumstances? Well, one is they look at what the infrastructure looks like. They make recommendations on things that can happen. They've been meeting with everyone from engineers and designers to the Dutch. You don't know how hard that is for me as someone of African and indigenous ancestry to do that, but it's all good, right? They have experience with this. So, um, so we are looking at um, what's being done in different parts of the world. We're sharing information as part of a movement. We also know that there's a cost involved and that the cost may be the thing that prevents us from doing what we need to do in each of our waterfronts. So in addition to looking at proactive plans, short, medium, and long term, we also need to look at what resilience looks like, our ability to bounce back, and what are our assets. But we're doing it literally assuming, I mean, it would be great if, if the government will be there to bail us out, but with the assumption that they will fail because they will be so overwhelmed and they will be in so many different places that we may have to fend for ourselves. Uh, thank you. That is a very uh, a candid statement and one to keep in mind that government will not necessarily be there when you need them, especially these days. Uh, I want to thank the panel. Wonderful presentations, all of you. And you're welcome to come up and talk to them for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Yes.